We are Irish Side of the Moon. Freedom of information. Personal empowerment. The Irish Side of the Moon. I still have with me. There are many sources of energy available. Everything is energy. My God, do we need this one. Free our mind. My mind. just a ride. ride. We can change it anytime we want. It's only a choice. No effort, no work, no job, no savings of money. A choice right now. Between fear and love. Love, love, love. love. Corporations have taken over the world. Freedom of information. Personal empowerment. The Irish side of the moon. Hello and welcome to the Irish side of the moon. My name is Gabriel Logue and I'll be your host this week again. Thank you for joining us online or on your local radio station. You are so welcome uh, right here from the hills of Donegal. Now last week's show was with Dr. Irving Kirsch on the Emperor's New Drugs, exploding the antidepressant myth. And in that show, Dr. Kirsch um, discussed his meta-analysis on existing data on the illogical uh, prescription and use of certain antidepressants. Uh, if you want to check that or any other previous show, uh, just go to the Irish Side of the Moon dot blogspot dot com. All our previous shows are archived there for your free listening. You can download them, listen to them in your car or whatever. Um, if you have any ideas for guests that you would like to hear or topics, uh, pop an email to Shane at the Irish Side of the Moon dot i and any comments or questions that you have um, on any shows that I've done, uh, pop an email along to Gabriel at the Irish Side of the Moon dot IE. And if it is for Michael, um, Michael at the Irish Side of the Moon dot IE. And if you want to ask Porik any questions about his shows, um, we can set up an email for him or just drop drop Porik's question along to my address gabriel at the irish side of the moon dot ie now you can join us on facebook uh, a never expand an army uh, joining in in discussions dropping comments uh, some great stuff thank you guys for your continued input um, it's what it's all about networking getting people interested um, awakening people up to possibilities and speaking of awakening people up to possibilities my next guest should certainly do that. Okay, let me introduce our special guest for this show, uh, Dr. Joseph P. Farrell. He has a doctorate in patristics from the University of Oxford and pursues research in physics, alternative history, and science, and strange stuff. His book, The Giza Death Star, was published in the spring of 2002 and was his first venture into alternative history and science. The sequel, The Giza Death Star Deployed, came out in spring 2003, and the final book of the Giza Death Star trilogy, The Giza Death Star Destroyed, in 2005. Additionally, he has published two books on Nazi secret weapons, Reich of the Black Sun, and The SS Brotherhood of the Bell. His new book, The Cosmic War, Interplanetary Warfare, Modern Physics, and Ancient Texts, came out in the autumn of 2007 and the sequel to the SS Brotherhood of the Bell, Secrets of the Unified Field, the Philadelphia Experiment, the Nazi Bell, and the Discarded Theory came out in March of 2008. He has made numerous appearances on Coast to Coast AM and Project Camelot. And here he is for the first time on the Irish Side of the Moon. You are very, very welcome. A warm Donegal welcome to you, sir. Well, thanks for having me on, Shane. Uh, Gabriel? Gabriel, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry. I keep getting emails from somebody named Shane. I'm well, sorry. He, he's our he's our point man. He's our contact man. He does oh, all, I see. Yeah, he does all the work in the background. I just uh, I just talk. The first, <laughs> the first question that I want to ask you is, what uh -huh. is patristics? Well, patristics is the the study of of the doctrine of the Church Fathers. It's it sounds like it's a rather narrow discipline, but in point of fact, when you when you study that, you have to know a lot of languages, Latin and Greek, of course, and certainly French and German help. Uh, you have to study law, canon law, history of science, a lot of philosophy. So it's it's a rather <laughs> it's a rather intense degree. 
Okay, and, and how do you uh, overlay that on some of the work that you do? How do you marry statistics with? Well, that's an excellent question. I don't really attempt to do that. Um, you know, I, the the study of patristics is really a study of, of ancient texts, and in in reading some of those texts, I, I also uh, studied a bit of mathematics when I was in high school, mathematics and physics. So that's always been kind of a hobby. And I began to notice when I was reading some of these philosophical texts that they made more sense as metaphors of topology, which is a certain kind of, of mathematics. So I began reading texts in that way, and that kind of got me started on, on some of these uh, books on ancient history and so on, because I really don't attempt to overlay any theology or anything like that in any of my books at all. Okay, so rather than look, looking at the text and reading the text and taking them uh -huh. literally, you're trying to get beneath the, I suppose, the essence of the language. What what is laid down for those that are willing to discover? Is that right? Something? Yeah. Okay. Well, it's 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 a little bit more than that. I think um, my operating model is to assume that there was, for want of a better expression a very high civilization that pre-existed Egypt and Sumer and, and the Indus Valley civilizations. And that, in fact, is what they themselves say. They, they define themselves as legacies of that civilization rather than as, you know, the beginning of civilization. So what I do is I assume that this civilization left as much science as it could, and it did so in the only technical language that it that would survive some cataclysms that it had gone through, and that was the language of, of metaphysics. So, I, I'm really assuming something more than just uh, that there is a mathematical metaphor in these some of these ancient texts. I'm also assuming that that metaphor is intentional. So it's it's kind of a matter of decoding it. Okay, and was there? When you were doing your um, theology, yeah, when you were doing uh -huh. patristics, um, before, during, or after, when, when was the moment that you, you uh, during your studies, you said to yourself, okay, there's something much deeper or uh, more ancient here? Well, I actually, that's another good question. I actually had that realization <laughs> as I was doing my PhD, and <laughs> I, I didn't share my, my thoughts uh, with anybody at the time. You know, that would have been academic suicide. <laughs> so I basically just kept a, a bunch of private notebooks jotting down what I, what I was seeing in the text. And when I quit uh, college teaching in this country, I decided I might as well write down some of my kooky ideas and publish them. Okay. So that's kind of the, the germination of those books. Okay, and that's, is that a germination, is that a pun? Is that a, an intentional pun? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. okay, you can write that down too. Um, so when did you, when did you um, focus your sights on the Giza um, plateau or the Giza pyramid was that um, an integral part, or did it sort of come after um, some uh, investigation? Well, it was a bit of both. To be honest with you, I've always been fascinated with the Great Pyramid ever since I was a boy. My father was an engineer, and I recall very vividly as a boy he and another engineer that they used to play cards with talking about the Great Pyramid and, and what a fabulously engineered structure it was, you know, and that kind of lodged in the back of my brain. And then one time on vacation traveling across North Dakota, the, there is a, a, an old phased array radar that was never completed out in the middle of nowhere, and you can kind of see it off in the distance on a highway. And I saw that, and, and it looks like a pyramid with kind of the top half lopped off of it. And I thought at the time, as a teenager, that, you know, that's rather interesting. I wonder if the Great Pyramid had any sort of military application. And then I read, of course, uh, some of the books of Zechariah Sitchin, and in particular uh, a book called The Wars of Gods and Men, in which he makes a case on some ancient texts that, in fact, the, the Great Pyramid had been 
built or used as some sort of weapon. But he never pursues that idea, which is <laughs> just very odd. And then I read uh, Christopher Dunn's book uh, later on called The Giza Power Plant, and everything just kind of came together, and I thought I might as well investigate the hypothesis. So that's kind of the beginning of, of how those three books came about. Okay, so again, for my own benefit and for everyone listening, uh -huh. um, what have you discovered or what, what have you um, uncovered, um, again, yourself and in conjunction with other researchers uh, about uh -huh. the pyramid uh, at Giza? Well, I, I must be honest. My hypothesis is not well received by most other pyramid researchers. In fact, they don't even like to talk about it. But my hypothesis is essentially that if you investigate the structure from an engineering point of view and if you investigate it in conjunction with some ancient texts, particularly some, some Babylonian texts that, that are used by Sitchin, the definite hypothesis emerges that this structure was at least used, if not built and intended, as some sort of weapon. So I began to investigate how that would be possible and, and came across a kind of physics that, for want of a better expression, can be called scalar physics or torsion physics, whatever you want to call it that is very, very different from what we conceive of as, as kind of the standard model in, in physical mechanics, relativity and quantum mechanics, and so on and so forth. But basically, what I do is, is I outline in those books a case that if you consider all of the texts, if you consider all the engineering that went into that structure, and if you take the hypothesis of Chris Dunn that it was actually built as some sort of power plant, there is no way that on any conventional physics model you'd get much electrical power out of that at all. So there's another kind of physics altogether that's involved in the book, and pardon me, in the structure. And that's basically what I outline in those three books. I want to add something else, if I may, and that is that all of my books, even the Nazi uh, books, are kind of centered around this theme of this type of physics. So in other words, there's, there's an underlying current that ties them all together. So uh, it may seem strange on the one hand that I'm investigating great pyramids and Nazi secret weapons, but, but in point of fact, it's, it's all kind of the same physics. Um, yeah, it may appear strange, but at the same time, <clears throat> history being history, the way it's been presented to us, uh, people yes. like yourself are unpicking, okay, what, what, are, what has been going on? I mean, what... What really precipitated certain wars? Um, what were the the, the different uh, groups really after? So your, right. your contention is that the the Great Pyramid, uh, the one we know about in, in Egypt and possibly the yes. all over the planet, um, the ones in China are of great interest to me because I know nothing about them. But your contention is that this is the remnants of a once great high tech civilization. Um, yes. Used for whatever means. It could have been a weapon, uh, offensive or defensive, or it could have right. have multi functions. So, where does the Nazis come in? Well, that's another excellent question. Um, I began to to research a story that was first broken by a Polish researcher by the name of Igor Witkowski, who uncovered a a, a very, very secret Nazi wartime project called the Bell after the collapse of communism and when a bunch of people, as they were wont to do, started talking about things. And he, he picked this story up. It was popularized in a book by a British author by the name of Nick Cook in a book called The Hunt for Zero Point. And I was reading both of these books and came to the conclusion that there's much more going on in terms of, of the physics than, than either of those researchers talked about. And that's kind of where I started with, with my investigations. And again, if we, if we look at this physics, the thing that ties it all together is that it is a profoundly unified physics. In other words, it allows you to engineer the fabric of space-time locally, as it were, on the, on the laboratory bench. 
And what you get out of that is a tremendous potential for three things. You can, you can obviously engineer this physics for a kind of zero-point energy or free energy, if you want to call it that. You can engineer it in such a way that you would get a very advanced field propulsion. And the third thing that you could engineer it for, obviously, if you're tinkering around with the fabric of space-time, is you can engineer it as a weapon. And let's, let's address that head-on and say that if you're engineering the fabric of space-time for a weapon, theoretically, you have a potential weapon that would make a hydrogen bomb look like a firecracker. In other words, it's truly planet-busting stuff. So. I think the Nazis with this Bell project were probably after those three things. Um, all, all the research that I've managed to, to do on the subject in several books convinces me that they were successful enough that they decided to keep this project to themselves and continue researching it after the war, which I believe they did in, in uh, Argentina. So, yeah, it's another big, big story. And, it's, and again, the physics is directly tied to what I think was going on in the Great Pyramid. Okay. And just to give people a, an idea of um, maybe uh, an understanding of what maybe led the Nazis, I mean, the, the Nazis had a deep connection with the occult, anything that was hidden. So they, yes. they were um, pursuing, engaged with finding um, any old or hidden technology through reading um, uh, the, the, the old scripts, such as yourself, yes. and um, going a little deeper. So they had the means, yes. the resources, and the will to power to, to um, chase that. Well, yeah, I think, I think you definitely have some sort of esoteric influence behind what the Nazis were doing. And in fact, I, I get into quite a bit of that part of the story about the Bell Project in a book of mine that's called The Philosopher's Stone, because there is a clear, clear esoteric influence at work with that project. And to give you an example of what I mean, if you, if you look at the corporate logo of the Nazi party, which of course is the swastika, if you look at that, as a physicist would look at that. What you have there in that, in that diagram is a vector diagram. You've got a system of rotation, and then you've got a system of stress in the medium. So in other words, Nazi thinking is, is deeply suffused with occult ideas. But if you look at those ideas from the physics that was being talked about between the wars and then uh, prior to World War II under the Nazi regime, you clearly get the idea that they are interpreting these old texts from the standpoint of the physics models that they're adopting, rather like, like what I was uh, seeing in some of the ancient metaphysical texts. So yes, I think you're absolutely dead on there. There's, there's a clear esoteric influence at work. And, and who was the main um, thrust uh, within the Nazi elite, the top, or the, mm -hmm. was the, the hidden the hidden group. Who was who was the main um, protagonist? And not that's well, that's that's an excellent question, and I can tell you one name in particular that again is a direct tie-in to ancient Egypt, and that's the well-known esoteric scholar by the name of, of Schwaller de Lubish. Uh, he was he was the fellow that, of course, wrote the famous book called The Temple of Man, uh, publishing his many years of research on the Temple of Luxor in Egypt. But most people do not know, or they're not aware of the fact that during the war, he was quite a Nazi file and did, in fact, work for the Nazis. So in other words, you have yet another clear influence at work and, and a tie-in between the Nazis and Egypt. And, and there's another fellow I should mention in addition to that. This is a fellow by the name of Karl Maria Villegut. He was an SS uh, brigadier general. And he was Heinrich Himmler's personal occult guru, if you will. And he's the one that wrote several esoteric treatises. I refer to them in the Philosopher's Stone, because in these treatises, you can find in occult language the very same kind of physics of, of a rotating medium that they're working on with the bell. So in other words, again, I think there's a clear uh, occult influence. 
But on the scientific side, I, I want to mention a couple of people there that are very important to the story, and, and that would be Dr. Walter Gerlach, who was uh, a very, very famous, internationally well-known physicist prior to the war. He was actually the project head for the Bell. And he was fascinated with things like rotating systems, gravitation, things of this sort. So in other words, the Nazis were after the big prize. And in fact, I, I should mention that the Bell Project was classified much, much higher within the Third Reich than their own atomic bomb project. So in other words, that, that was kind of old news to them. They were, they were going after the grand prize of, of being able to manipulate gravity itself. Okay. Before we get into the, the Bell uh, uh -huh. project itself, can you take uh -huh. us through um, what is known by mainstream and then what is, has been uncovered by researchers like yourself, uh, specifically about the, the pyramid um, at Giza, the Cheops, uh, from, an, from an electrical and an engineering point of view? Well, from, from the straight engineering point of view, the best work, uh, the best book available is a book by a British engineer by the name of Christopher Dunn, and the book is called The Giza Power Plant. And basically, it's an engineer's look at the Great Pyramid. And what he does is he points out that, first of all, the structure is engineered with optical precision. And this is something that has been well known even within Egyptological circles ever since the days of, of uh, William Flinders Petrie. This optical precision of the structure means, therefore, that it's some kind of machine. Now, the way he outlines it in his book is if you look very carefully at certain components in the structure, such as the so-called sarcophagus in the king's chamber, if you look at the grand gallery, the whole thing is built as kind of an acoustic resonator. The Grand Gallery is, is definitely built according to very sound acoustical principles. The sarcophagus is, is, in his thinking, built as the optical cavity for an actual maser, in other words, a microwave uh, laser. So in his analysis, it's a machine to produce power but he never really says power for what, nor does he really explain how you're going to get very much power out of the structure. On any conventional analysis, it's really not very possible. But if you look at alternative researchers, uh, people like Richard Hoagland and so on and so forth, well, Hoagland recently did a very interesting set of experiments on the pyramids down in Tikal, Mexico. He was taking torsion readings based on a Bulova Accutron watch. And if he stood or sat on the structures themselves, the, the little tuning fork inside the watch would vibrate wildly. Now, the significance of that is, is that there is nothing within standard physics models, general relativity, and, and so on and so forth, to predict why the inertial properties of the tuning fork in his little watch would vibrate and vary that drastically in the presence of pyramidal structures. So in other words, there is some sort of alternative physics in play here, and that's kind of where I take off in the Giza Death Star series, because what I believe these structures are is they are massive uh, gravity torsion resonators. Now, to kind of explain what torsion is, if you want to think of of emptying a, a soda can and then wring it like a dish rag in your hands. What that will do is it will spiral and fold and pleat the can. Now think of the can as representing space-time. That's what torsion does to the fabric of space-time. So in other words, torsion fields of a very intense sort would change the inertial properties of things in their field. And that's exactly what he measured with his, his Accutron watch down in Mexico. So that's basically what I think these, at least at Giza, what these pyramidal structures were designed to do. They were designed to manipulate the torsion field of, of uh, the local gravitational field of the Earth. So in other words, they're very, very sophisticated structures. And if that's so, then that would explain why we see such precision in the Great Pyramid. And secondly, it would explain why we see so many dimensional analogs within that structure 
of the celestial properties of local space. Uh, one of the things I, I talk about in the Giza Death Star is the fact that you have dimensional measures within the structure that embody the speed of light, that embody the distance of the Earth to the sun, that embody the neutral point of, the, of gravity between the Earth and the moon, all sorts of very anomalous things. Well, you wouldn't need dimensional analogs like that in a structure if it was just for a power plant, as Mr. Dunn suggests. But you would need them if you were building a structure that was intending to manipulate the fabric of local space-time. So that, again, is, is part of my argument for what, what the Great Pyramid was, namely a torsion resonator. Okay, so it's mathematically beautiful. In, in many ways. Oh yes, absolutely. Oh yes, it, it's there, you know you can sit down and, and spend days just just reading all the mathematical and dimensional analogs that are in the structure. Okay, a um, couple of things. Uh, I was chatting to uh -huh. uh, Patrick Flanagan a couple of weeks ago, and uh -huh. I had mentioned when I came back from the states in '97. I prior to that, I had absolutely no interest in anything. Uh, that wasn't mainstream. In fact, I probably didn't have any interest in anything. But anyway, I started to get very interested in everything. And one of the uh -huh. first things that I had come across was a, um, a picture in a schematic of the, um, the Great Pyramid. And it was uh, pretty in-depth showing the, the scorch marks of the, the large, the one, two, three, four, I think it was four large um, blocks um, at the top, yes. the King's Chamber, I think it was anyway, and the, the vents. <clears throat> and I just got a sort of a, when I looked at that, um, a, a flash in my mind that this thing was so powerful that there was, uh, there was some energy um, going through this, so powerful that it uh, possibly could um, act as uh, a, a, an almost a jet to push the earth um, out of the way. Yes. Now, I got yes. that. I, had, I didn't at that stage, and I still really don't have the... the the, the physics knowledge behind me to unravel or uh, use deduction, but I, I'm not really worried about that. Um, <clears throat> the what is the effect on the ionic uh, properties that the, the, the pyramid that the pyramid has? Well, that's a very interesting question. One of the things I point out in the, in the second book, in the Giza Death Star deployed, is that during World War II. British pilots were told not to fly their planes at low altitude directly over the Great Pyramid, because if they did, their instruments <laughs> would get all scrambled. And it's very interesting that you mentioned Patrick Flanagan, because he actually produced a picture of little pyramids that he had uh, built and, and then taken a kind of a Karelian photograph of them. And there very clearly is some sort of uh, electrical jet emerging from the the apex of, of these little pyramids. And that was confirmed by some research that was done in the Soviet Union. Most people don't realize this, but the Soviet Union back in the 70s began a, a very secret project of investigating the physics properties of pyramids. They actually built several large pyramids right outside of Moscow out of, out of fiberglass to investigate pyramidal properties. So there is something, and, and it's very interesting that you mention ions, because the Russians actually did take measurements of, of ion jets out of the top of their pyramids that they built. So this, you know, we're, we're just really kind of beginning to rediscover the inherent power in these structures. So, you know, it's an, it's an excellent question. Well, it's only an excellent question because I was trying to do um, the, the research so that I could ask decent questions so the listeners could get as much as, uh, as possible out of this. Um, uh -huh. Because you had mentioned um, in, your, in your books uh, that the pyramid was possibly a, a weapon of some sort. Uh -huh. <clears throat> and I got to thinking, well, if somebody is going to build structure or structures possibly linked uh -huh. to the world, um, there might be have been multi-functions, and one of the functions I was thinking on, um, specifically on the, 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 in the realms of the, the ionic effects of the pyramid, mm -hmm. is that if fields can be generated, not just locally, but globally, 
through a, um, a system yes. of pyramids that would enhance the 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 uh, physiological and the neurological effect of living organisms, thereby basically um, lifting levels of consciousness and lifting levels of uh, physiology to uh, enhance uh -huh. physiology. Have you come across that? Well, this is something that's very interesting. The Again, the Soviets did research on precisely these types of things. They discovered that if they left certain items, uh, water, medicines, things like that, inside their pyramids and then administered these things to people with various uh, mental disorders or, or chemical dependencies or so on and so forth, that they would show marked signs of improvement. So there appears to be some sort of, of uh, effect on, on conscious properties, on, on neurological properties. And in fact, I've actually heard Chris Dunn suggest a very similar thing. So yeah, I do think that's possible. And and the other part of your your statement that I think is is worth addressing very briefly is that it does appear that there is some sort of uh, grid-like structure on the globe, on the surface of the Earth, with these pyramids at certain key locations which, again, would make sense if you're dealing with the idea that these things are manipulating torsion fields of some sort and for whatever purpose. So, yeah, I think, I think you're, you're, again, your intuition <laughs> is pretty accurate there. Okay, well, talking of intuition, um, again, when I was doing the research uh, for, for this interview, uh, one, one name kept popping up in my mind. And I would say, no, 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 this isn't, this isn't for this interview. And it kept popping up. So I had to chase it down after a while. It was Nikola Tesla. Now, uh -huh. <laughs> well, I know that Tesla was uh, innately interested in the pyramid insofar as he probably looked at it and said, OK, I'm not accepting the, what the story is. Let's, let's use my Tesla mind. <clears throat> so he was um, interested in electromagnetism and frequency and everything everything really <clears throat> so uh, I think Wardenclyffe was um, based on his understanding of the mathematics and the electromagnetic function possibly of the pyramids <clears throat> and I know that his a lot of his research went to was either taken by the FBI or was um, sequestered mm -hmm. by his nephew to go to Belgrade in Yugoslavia and was communist uh -huh. run at that stage and nobody had um, access to that in the West, but the Russians had access through the communist regime. Um, well, actually, to be to be uh, very frank, it was taken to Belgrade prior to the to the Nazi invasion in May of 1941. So the first people that had access to it were the Nazis. <laughs> you mean te okay? So Tesla's work or Tesla's ideas or just the ideas in general that were floating around at that stage, the Nazis grabbed on hold of. Oh yes, absolutely they did. Absolutely they did. And in fact, uh, one of the things I mention in a book called uh, Babylon's Banksters, it just came out uh, last year, is that if you look at what the Germans were doing between the wars, in other words, prior to, to the Nazi regime taking power, they were researching a variety of, of projects, secret projects under the Weimar Republic that could only be described as, as Tesla-like in nature. So they were they were onto this at a very very early stage, and you know I think that all of this is tied together with their interest in in uh, Schwaller de Lubish and and his research in Egypt. I think it's tied together with uh, their Bell project. Uh, I think it's there is definitely a case to be made that uh, whatever antenna system that they built near the Brocken Mountain there in, in the Harz Mountains had something to do with, with a Wardenclyffe-like uh, Tesla experiment. So yeah, I think you're, again, I think your intuitions are very sound here. Okay, so we'll get into the Bell project right after this break, folks. Um, we'll be right back with Dr. Joseph Farrell. You're listening to The Irish Side of the Moon. You can hear our new episodes every Monday on radiomedia.org and irishsideofthemoon.blogspot.com. You can also download episodes from iTunes, Stitcher, and many other sites. 
You can follow us on Twitter, you can join our Facebook group, and if you're already in the group, don't forget to invite your friends. If you have any ideas for future guests on the show, send an email to shane at the Irish side of the moon dot IE. We are Irish side of the moon, freedom of information. And welcome back to the Irish side of the moon. And we're here with Dr. Joseph Farrell. And we're about to start talking about the Bell Project. Now, Dr. Farrell, can you give uh-huh. us um, the Bell Project 101 version? <laughs> Well, the, the, the Bell Project was Nazi Germany's most highly classified secret weapons research project during World War II. Uh, it was, as I said in the first part of the, of the show, it was given a classification or, or described in, in the documentation as Kriegsentscheidend, which, which means war decisive. And this is the only project where this specific word is ever used. In other words, not even their atom bomb had had this high of a classification. Now, basically, what I believe the Bell Project was, and again, I've, I've written about six books covering various aspects of this project. It's a very, very big story, and it really can't be told in, in uh, you know, just one book. But basically, what they were after was a gateway technology based on a profoundly unified physics that was a hyperdimensional physics. And, and I described some aspects of this in, in my book, Secrets of the Unified Field. And they were after this physics, they were after this technology for essentially three things. The first was, of course, to have a virtually inexhaustible energy supply to, to make Germany energy independent. The second thing that they were after was a very, very advanced field propulsion. In other words, they were after basically anti-gravity. And the third thing, of course, Nazis, <laughs> Nazis being Nazis, <laughs> they, were after, they were after a doomsday weapon. Because again, if you, if you have the ability to engineer space-time locally, then you can, of course, engineer it as a weapon. So there, there's, there's your Bell project in a nutshell. The Bell itself was a device about 15 to 18 feet tall. It was about 9 to 12 feet wide. It was bell-shaped, and that, that's why it has the name Die Glocke, or the bell in, in German. It was bell-shaped. Inside this device, there were two counter-rotating hollow drums that I argue were stacked one on top of each other. And they put a serum, it was codenamed Serum 525, which was a very heavy, liquid, reddish color goo, if you want to call it that, that I think was probably made out of a combination of, of mercury and, and thorium oxide. All right, They spun these, these counter-rotating cylinders up and then electrically pulsed the, the ox, mercury thorium oxide that was being rotated in it at extremely high direct current voltage. Now what that would do was would be create a plasma and that plasma, in turn, is going to be driven inward, and it's going to release massive amounts of energy. It's going to create a collapsing magnetic field. And as a result of all of this, you're going to get kind of a, for want of a better expression, you're going to get kind of a, a little space-time bubble around this device. Now, it was tested outside, outdoors, on occasion. And some of the, this is kind of how Igor Vitkovsky got onto the story, because some Polish concentration camp victims that, that had actually worked on this project and survived the war, but never talked, did so after the collapse of communism. And they described seeing this thing at night glowing a kind of a pale blue glow and literally floating or levitating above the tree line. So in other words, what, what all the evidence suggests is that this project was amazingly successful. The problem that the Nazis had was that it gave off very, very deadly local field effects. In fact, the first time they tested it, it killed seven of the scientists <laughs> that were testing the, testing the device. So in other words, they had, a, they had a technology, but it was not a practical technology in the sense that you could put someone in this thing and fly it, <laughs> fly it around, you know. 
So I think probably what they did at the at the end of the war, in fact, I argue this case in a book called The Nazi International, is they kept this project to themselves. In other words, they kept it out of, out of Russian hands and they kept it out of Allied hands and basically shipped the whole thing lock, stock, and barrel to Argentina where they continued to work on it after the war. And in fact, I, I point out the evidence uh, in the Nazi International uh, as to why I think that. So it's a very, very big story. Okay. How, when do you think that this, the, the Bell Project had started initially? Well, uh, that's, that's a great question. In fact, I, I increasingly, Gabriel, come to think that it probably started between the wars and under the Weimar Republic. And the reason I say that is that the project head, uh, again, Dr. Walter Gerlach, who, who was the project head of the Bell Project, wrote a short little article that I put in, in the book, The SS Brotherhood of the Bell, in which he talks about subjecting mercury to extreme electrical stress. All right. Now, we have to remember who Gerlach is. He's a fellow that conducted an experiment called the Stern-Gerlach experiment that actually won his, his college Stern, the Nobel Prize. So in other words, Walter Gerlach was a very, very well-known, internationally well-known physicist in between the wars. And his specialty was rotating magnetic and gravitational systems. That's what his bag was, all right? So this is the man that's in charge of the Bell Project. In this article that he wrote between the wars in 1924 for the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, what he said was, you know, okay, we've noticed these funny properties when we subject mercury to electrical stress. Boy, wouldn't it be neat if we could, you know, investigate this more fully. So in other words, what you have is, is a typical scientist's appeal for the government to cough up some money so, so that he can investigate this stuff. And I think that probably this is actually what happened. I think the Weimar Republic operating as it was under the under the constrictions of, of the Versailles Treaty, was pursuing a number of very avant-garde, exotic, secret projects. And this may have been one of them, and the Nazis simply inherited it, uh, a lot of these projects, when they took power. Just to, again, to let people um, listening uh, sort of get a flavor for what was happening um, in 19... Uh -huh. From nine, from really eighteen from eighteen ninety right through to nineteen uh, thirty nineteen forty, there were huge advances in understanding um, in theory of electromagnetism yes. and the turning of theory into practical engineerable projects. So much so yes. that it was um, pretty advanced. And now sixty, seventy, eighty years later, we really haven't the public the as a globe hasn't seen any of this advanced material. So for for the greater purposes, a lot of the public um, would have um, possibly a hard time uh, um, believing this, going, well, if this was going on 60, 70, 80, 100 years ago, I mean, some of Tesla's ideas, some of Gerlach's ideas were, were revolutionary, um, and yet yes. you don't see them. So for you now to um, be bringing all this to the light. Uh, I just want everyone to to sort of uh, tune in to the fact that there was advances made a hundred years ago that we still haven't seen. That's what I'm trying to get to, get to. So just yes. to give a background of, of um, what you're talking about. So excuse excuse the interruption. No, it, 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 in fact, I, I was going to try and address that because I think, again, you've, you've hit on something very important that people need to realize and that I attempt to do in my books. Um, I, I'm not, I wouldn't consider myself your standard alternative researcher. My books are very thoroughly footnoted and, and documented. Uh, and one of the things I try and do, especially in, in uh, Secrets of the Unified Field, is to point out that there are physics papers in the literature beginning as early as 1903 with a paper by E.T. Whitaker called, um, oh boy, On the Partial Differential Equations of Mathematical Physics, you know, <laughs> a real exciting title. <laughs> but he published that in uh, Mathematische Annalen in, in Germany. 
in 1903. And this is a pre-relativistic paper, but it's a very interesting paper because what he does is he takes uh, extrapolations of, of Maxwell's equations and analyzes them as longitudinal waves in the medium. In other words, what he's talking about long before Einstein comes along is, is gravitational waves. And there's another fellow that I should mention here that's very, very important that most people will never have heard of, and his name is Gabriel Krohn, K-R-O-N. This man actually won a prize at the University of Liège in Belgium in 1935 for a paper that he wrote in which he took some of the mid-20s to, to late-1920s unified field theory papers that were being published in Germany, Einstein's paper, uh, Eddington's papers, uh, Taylor Kaluza's papers, and he shows that these higher dimensional unified field theories can be used by electrical engineers to explain anomalies that they always encountered in large networked rotating electrical circuits. All right? Now stop and consider what he's just really told you. He's told you that with 1935 technology, you can engineer with standard electrical circuits. You can engineer electromagnetism and gravity. That's what he's just told you. So in other words, what I try to do in my books, Gabriel, is document the fact that, you know, while modern physicists will tell you that those theories were incomplete, my point is they may have been theoretically incomplete, but they were engineerable theories, and that's where the Nazis took off. Yeah. Okay, and again, it's, you, you said it a lot more eloquently than I did. Uh, the, again, the, it's, the, the theories and the engineerable projects were around, um, and now 70 years later, we don't yes. see them, but we'll get back to that in a little bit. Back to the Bell Project. Now, uh -huh. at the end of the war, the Germany um, was defeated. Um, yes. Some of the scientists went to the U.S., some of the scientists yes. to Russia. Um, what happened to the Nazi party, or the, the elite of the Nazis? <laughs> well... It's interesting that you should ask that, because I begin the Nazi International by pointing out a very curious thing. I reproduce both of the German surrenders. Germany actually surrendered twice. Most, <laughs> most people don't realize that, but, but they had a surrender on May 7, 1945, in, in Reims, France, with uh, Colonel General Yodel signing on behalf of the German military. And then they had another signing in Berlin the next day with three representatives of, of the three main service branches of, of the Wehrmacht, um, Field Marshal Keitel and, and uh, Admiral von Friedeberg and, and uh, General Stumpf, I think it was, that, that represented the Luftwaffe. But if you read these documents, there's <laughs> a really strange thing about them. And it's rather obvious if, if you stop and think about it, but it's so obvious, you know, you wouldn't think about it unless someone pointed it out to you. But there is no representative signing either surrender instrument on behalf of the Reich government, all right? And there's no representative signing on behalf of the Nazi party, Okay. So in other words, the only thing surrendering here <laughs> is the German military, <laughs> nothing else. Now, I happen to think that this might be just a little more than coincidental because, in my opinion, Gabriel, there were three major Nazi leaders that made it out of the Third Reich and made their way to Latin America and set up shop there. And they were Martin Bormann, who was, of course, the, the uh, Nazi Party Reichsleiter, and then Heinrich Miller, who was the actual head of the Gestapo, all right? Mm. And then an SS general by the name of Hans Kammler. Now, these three guys are very significant because they each represent precisely what you would need 
in order to coordinate a large post-war extraterritorial Nazi state, quite literally, that is intent upon pursuing independently its own secret research. All right? And the reason I say that is because Martin Bormann was a financial genius. I mean, this man, uh, I like to joke that, you know, when you think of Bormann, think of Dick Cheney, but without warmth and charm, okay? <laughs> he, was, he was a real wheeler dealer. Okay. With, with Heinrich Miller as the head of the Gestapo, you had someone that was very, very adept at coordinating large counterintelligence networks, all right? And then with Hans Kammler, General Kammler, you actually had the man who was in charge by the end of the war of all, and I do mean every last bit of Nazi Germany's secret weapons research. He was, he was so to speak, the coordinator of all of it. So with these three men, you have really represented the, the structure, I think, of this post-war Nazi extraterritorial state. And I do believe that, that they all made it to, uh, out of Nazi Germany to Latin America, and I lay out the case for why I think that in the Nazi International. So yes, you're quite right. I think that you look at the escaping leaders, you look at the vast amount of loot that they, they took out of Europe, and, and by loot I mean not only money, liquid, liquid uh, assets, but hard assets like patents, scientists, uh, certain technologies that, that they spirited out of Europe and, and down to Latin America. So yeah, you're absolutely correct. The Nazis, uh, the Nazis quite literally survived the war, and they survived the war, and I want to emphasize this, they survived the war with a very, very healthy financial picture and with a very, very robust, although very covert, organization. Could you possibly go into um, some of the finances of the, the Nazi elite or the Nazi party, such as the, there was one massive um, corporation um, that existed up until very recently. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. I mean, that's one example. Could, could you just uh, sort of sure. bring, bring us through that from 1945 and how it possibly spread how the different corporations mingled, intertwined, and the, the type of traps that they laid for other people. Well, yeah, the, the corporation, the massive corporation that you're, you're talking about that was only gotten rid of very recently is, of course, IG Farben, Interesting Gemeinschaft Farben, Farben Industry. Uh, that cartel, that, that uh, what, combine, whatever you want to call it, was so enormous and so enormously powerful that it was only finally legally liquidated in the year 2003. <laughs> Okay, in other words, in very, very recent history, we finally managed to get rid of the last vestiges and traces of IG Farben. And of course, we really haven't gotten rid of it because the companies that went to make up the cartel, like Hicks and, and Bayer and Merck and so on and so forth, all these companies are still around, right? And they're very large. So, you know, just consider pooling them all together and you get an idea of the enormity and, and the enormous power of IG Farben. But what Farben really represents is kind of the Nazi philosophy of, of uh, corporatism. And to, to be very, very brief but very blunt, I think if you look at the first Bilderberg group meetings, you have, in my opinion, the coordination of a post-war detente between the Anglo-American corporate elite in, in London and New York City on the one hand and this surviving post-war Nazi international on the other. And the reason I say that is if you look at the founders of the Bilderberg Group, on the one side you'll find the Rothschilds involved, you'll find the Rockefellers involved. But on the European side, who's involved? Well, it's Prince Bernhard of the Netherlands. Who's Bernhard? Well, he's a German prince. He's an SS officer. He was in upper management at IG Farben. All right? And as an SS officer, 
he is going to be duty-bound to follow whatever chain of command might exist after the war. In other words, he's reporting directly to this Nazi international. Now, why do they have the, these meetings? Why do they set them up? Well, it's very simple, in my opinion. It's because this post-war Nazi international is literally sitting on a huge mountain of cash. I mean, my word, in Argentina alone, after the war, Juan Perón and Martin Bormann, and this is a known fact now, had a joint bank account just in Argentina of $800 million. Now, that's a hefty chunk of change in 1945. $800 million. So, $800 million just in Argentina. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> so, in other words, the Nazis are sitting on top of just an enormous amount of cash. The problem is, they have to launder it. And the only way or the only people with the facilities to do that are in London and New York City. So I, I think you can kind of guess at the sort of deal that was struck because Borman basically says to, to the, to the Anglo-American elite, okay, look, I'm going to turn all this money over to you guys, put it in your banks, and you can use it as a hidden reserve to expand your ledger credit-making entry ability, and then we'll use that money to, to rebuild Europe, which was precisely one of his post-war goals. All right. So I think this is the deal that was struck. But, and, and I've said this on so many occasions, again, if you're playing with Martin Bormann, you're playing with Dick Cheney without the warmth and charm. He's got an organization. He's got uh, his own intelligence network. He's certainly got uh, the kind of people that will be able to take you out. And what I'm suggesting, in other words, is, is yeah, he gives them all this money, but at some point the marker is going to come due. And they are researching all of the technologies to be able to pull the trigger when the time comes if that Anglo-American elite doesn't want to pay up. So, yeah, it's, it's a very, very scary picture. Okay, that's really thrown a very large cat uh, amongst the canaries. Um, because <laughs> yes, it in, has. In the, <laughs> a very hungry large cat with uh, lots of advanced technology. The, I suppose the, the, the undercurrent in the, the, uh, the, re, the uh, alternative research community is, uh -huh. uh, you know, names like the Bilderberg Group come up and the Council on Foreign Relations and the Trilateral right. Commission. And you hear the usual names like the, the Rockefellers, the Rothschilds, the Carnegies, blah, blah, blah. No, so you're throwing in um, something else. Uh, that I'm throwing Nazis into it. Nazis. <laughs> yes. So there's, there's two <laughs> factions, or there may be uh -huh. more, and how widespread these Nazis um, are throughout the, the world, uh, we may never know unless um, you're going to allude to it uh, in, the, in the next couple of minutes. So you mm -hmm. have old money, uh, for want of a better phrase, and you have the Nazis now. So the Nazis lent massive amounts with strings to the established power base. Right. Uh, and went off and did their research, which is really their their, their linchpin for whatever it is they want, world domination, uh, the usual Dr. Evil type of stuff. Um, right. Um, so are we now, um, especially in, uh, in, in Europe, um, I can, because I'm in Ireland here and we're, we're, we're in a real mess. So are we seeing the effects of this faction um, split or this faction, one faction, the Nazis saying, right guys, um, it's time now to pay up. I think uh, an excellent question, and I think if you read certain tea leaves, you are definitely looking at some major factional infighting in the so-called New World Order crowd. And I do believe that the Anglo-American corporate banking elite is definitely on the defensive. Um, if you, you know, let me give you but one tiny example. Please. The, the uh, BP oil spill in the Gulf, all right? Okay. That began on April 20th. Now, April 20th is the anniversary of Adolf Hitler's birthday. 
that in itself is not significant unless you look at other little Nazi anniversaries that have been celebrated in very peculiar ways, right in, in so to speak, right in front of us, but no one really notices it. Things like the Berlin Wall coming down on the anniversary of Kristallnacht in 1938. And that, in turn, was celebrated on the anniversary of, of Hitler's aborted uh, Beer Hall Putsch attempt in, in 1923. The landing of Apollo 11, the first lunar landing on July 20th, 1969, exactly 25 years to the day after the unsuccessful bomb plot attempt against Adolf Hitler. And on and on I could go. So in other words, there are little messages being sent back and forth between these two factions. And I definitely believe that uh, there is a breakdown of that post-war detente that began at the Bilderbergers. And just to kind of put the icing on the cake, I definitely believe that you can argue a case that at least as far as the destruction of the Twin Towers in New York City on 9-11 in, in 2001, that you can definitely argue kind of a circumstantial case that this was the opening shot in a kind of a covert underground war between these two factions. And I argue that case. There's, uh, Richard Hoagland has a paper up on his website, uh, enterprisemission.com. It's called The Norway Spiral Part 3. And in that paper, he cites uh, an analysis that I did for him of 9-11. Of and I kind of make, lay out that case uh, with uh, much more detail and the argumentation there. But yeah, I think you, you look at certain things happening in Europe. You look at certain things happening in this country. And it definitely appears to me that uh, our good old boys in, in the Bank of England and the Federal Reserve <laughs> are showing the distinctive signs of clear panic as if someone has the gun to their head. Okay, uh, the uh, researcher, what's his name, Ian Crane, um, has brought up that date, April, 20, April 19, 20, and 21st. There's been a spate every year of um, catastrophic incidences. So, yeah, again, it's, it smacks of occult on both sides. There's always these yes. um, uh, ritualistic events on the world stage, um, shots across the bow, as it were. Um, yes. The Norway spiral, was that, um, to the best of your knowledge, a particle beam weapon uh, demonstration? Well, not so much a particle beam weapon, but it, it is a, a directed energy weapon in the sense that I do believe it is a clear manifestation of, of uh, manipulation of torsion fields. And to me, it's, it's almost uh, conclusive that, you know, it is known that the European version of HARP, which is based outside of uh, Trondheim, Norway, I believe, that that was actually fired up when the Norway spiral appeared. So in other words, you know, it, it is a clear effect of whatever it was or whatever experiment that they were running. To me, it's very interesting that Chancellor Merkel basically told the United States, you know, you can take a hike with your missile defense system that you want to give us because we don't need it. Now, you know, Germany doesn't do anything without a plan. <laughs> so, you know, when, when she said that, I thought, uh-huh, so that means you've already got your own, and, and they gave us a little demonstration of that with the Norway spiral. Okay, and where was um, President Obama on that, on, on that occasion? President Obama was actually in Norway uh, receiving, getting ready to receive his uh, Nobel Peace Prize. So I think there you have, again, clear messages are being sent, you know, by one faction to another. <laughs> so, and I think, you know, if you look at, if you look at that uh, European version of HARP there in Norway, well, it's, it's, you don't have to look very far and wide to discover that the country with the principal interest in that whole project is precisely Germany. So, you know, <laughs> the, fingers are, <laughs> the fingers are pointing to Berlin. <laughs> Right. And again, we here in, in, in Europe, when I say Europe, 
I don't even know why I say Europe. I suppose we've been conditioned to think of Europe as the Irish people have have slowly, um, but more recently, very quickly thrown away, given away all their sovereignty. If we ever had any, yes. if I look back on the the writing of the Constitution of Ireland, we're a, a relatively young uh, state as, as states go, but we're an ancient peoples, but a relatively young right. state. The, the very writing of the Constitution um, was at a time when those with the mean and the will um, could send their agents to be at the table. So the, the very writing of the Constitution and how our supposed state was set up, um, we, we weren't in a good, uh, a good space. So the, the economic situation in Ireland now, we've grown very lazy, um, apathetic, and again, the, there's the whole fluoride uh, aspect comes into it. Um, there's really not that many countries that are heavily fluoridated, and we happen to be one of them. And it's always, uh, more recently, I'm like, I'm, go, I'm getting to ask, why Ireland? Why do the need to heavily fluoridate uh, Ireland? What is it about? What are, they, what are they scared of? I mean, because right now, I don't think they need to fear much because we have got so apathetic. They just kept throwing money. Here's a loan. Here's a loan. Just get lazy, get fat. Here's a loan, and uh, even with that, there are there are semi revolts going on, and people have had enough. Um, but the point I'm trying to make is, um, over the last 30 years, after treaty after treaty, the the centralisation of power uh, in Europe, although it's um, supposedly in Brussels, uh, it's demonstrably from um, Germany. They pull yes. the strings at every level. Yes. Um, and I used to I used to joke about Nazis um, back in the days. Um, but was... Well, let, you know, let's let's put that in perspective because Please. in in the Nazi International, I point out that that Martin Bormann, in his he had a very elaborate, uh, well thought out, well organized post war plan, and one of the major components of that plan was to create a European Federation, which in his words, Germany would be able to dominate, and here's his exact words, by elastic political means. So in other words, it was a part of, of post-war Nazi thinking to drive the European Union. And you know the prophecy has come true, because no sooner had Germany been uh, reunified, then the German government began a series, to me, of breathtaking unilateral actions, namely cracking up Yugoslavia, uh, recognizing Croatia, you know, basically recreating the, the little Croatian puppet state that they had in, in uh, World War II. They cracked up Czechoslovakia, and then once they had done that, they put the economic screws to the Czech Republic, you know. Uh, to me, it, it, it was breathtaking to watch because, of course, people over here didn't realize that they were reading or, or watching a, a replay of, you know, of 1938 all over again. But, yeah, Germany, uh, you know, it, it, the reality is is that in the European Union, things are be the shots are being called in Paris and Berlin. That's basically it. Unfortunately, yes. Um, back to the technology part of it, based on uh -huh. torsion. Get into what torsion can do if utilized mm -hmm. by sane human beings on this planet. Well, torsion, let's, let's look at what torsion is mathematically. There are two different versions of, of the mathematical uh, expression of torsion. One is, one is the einstein karton uh, torsion tensor, and then the other one is, is the Ricci torsion tensor. In the Einstein version, which is the one that most physicists are familiar with, the effects of torsion are very, very negligible. So usually physicists don't pay any attention to it, all right? In the Ricci version, the effects of torsion are, are significantly greater. So torsion, again, if you want to think of it, just think of my little illustration of, of an empty soda can. 
that you're wringing like a dish rag. That's literally what torsion does. It spirals, folds, and pleats the fabric of space-time. And the ends of the can draw closer together. So in other words, one thing that would emerge from a viable manipulation of extreme, and I want to underline that word, of extreme torsion effects, would be to have a practical field propulsion. All right. The other thing that you can do with torsion is if you're engineering the fabric of space-time, then, you know, if you're dealing with sane people, you know, in other words, people that <laughs> don't want to use it to blow up a planet, <laughs> then, then, you know, you can, you can have uh, access to a virtually limitless energy supply. Uh, you're, you're, you're tapping in, so to speak, to the energy of, of the fabric of space-time itself, which is in certain models of, of physical mechanics is, is virtually inexhaustible. And there are, you know, to be fair, there are physicists that dispute that whole notion, but uh, I, I tend to think that, that the idea is actually true. So yeah, you've got, you've got a technology, you've got a, a potential for solving the world's energy supply by developing these types of, of technologies. And that, again, is, I think, one reason that the technology is, and the physics behind it is so suppressed because it is a, once you understand it, it's a fairly easy thing to do. And you certainly don't, if you're sitting on top of, you know, a huge block of stock in an oil company, <laughs> you, don't, you don't want to see this stuff get out. Yeah, there goes the shares, right? Yeah, there goes the shares. <laughs> okay, so, again, this stuff's been positive. Um, been bandied around for um, possibly a hundred years and has uh -huh. what development do you think at what stage of sophistication is the technology um, oh and, boy. in the different hands I mean um, something we haven't really talked about is um, have the US and have Russia and have maybe China but anyway let's focus on the US did they, do get they have these any, yeah yeah exactly <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, the simple answer is we did not get our hands on any of the Nazi technology that was utilizing this stuff. We got our hands on a few of the scientists that were involved with it. But by and large, we did not get our hands on the technology. In fact, I, I lay out or, and kind of imply the case in the Nazi International that we weren't really paying too close of attention until Juan Perón let his secret project in Argentina that was being run by some of these Nazi scientists out of the bag. And when we finally wised up to what was going on in the mid-1950s, bang, at that instant in this country, public discussion within magazines and so on of anti-gravity absolutely ceased, okay? So we entered the, the game in this country about 10 to 20 years after the Germans, all right? I do think this country has certainly developed a lot of very sophisticated, very advanced technology that probably boggled the imagination. But I think it was doing so not to face a Soviet threat, but in actuality, a very little known and certainly would never be discussed openly and certainly would be laughed at if you were to suggest it, but a, a potential threat posed by this extraterritorial Nazi state, all right? The other countries that I think have possession of aspects of this technology, of aspects of this physics, would certainly be Russia, uh, I certainly think the United Kingdom has uh, been investigating it full tilt. The French, um, the Brazilians, believe it or not, and to a lesser extent, China and, and India and Japan. In other words, if you think of, of the, the uh, standard or traditional geopolitical powers right now, those are the countries that, that would be investigating it. And absolutely, Germany. Mm. Okay, so uh, possibly the Nazis are 20 years ahead um, of everyone else. 
possibly you know if they've if they if they have kept up their their investment and managed to perhaps pull some partners into it uh, there's been a suggestion by an American researcher by the name of Tom Bearden that there are some other partners involved, uh, private partners involved in this research, including the Japanese yakuza. <laughs> you know, it's just horror of horrors, but you know that's that's what he suggests. So you know, if you can imagine a, a kind of a, a Japanese mafia underground with <laughs> with tortured technology, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, the picture is very very complex, but. Um, yeah, I think if they have kept their investment up, yeah, they've probably managed to maintain a certain amount of, of lead over everybody else. But uh, that's not to say that, that you're dealing with second stringers with, with the Russians or, or certainly with some of the engineers in this country. So, you know, it's hard to say how, how wide or narrow the gap is right now. Yeah, you've got some very, very intelligent people with um, resources available to them to do what they need to do to continue on their work. That leads me to a question. I don't know how, even know how to ask the question because it's sort of ambiguous, but it's something you alluded to in some of your some of your work, and it's uh, pertaining to the hyperdimensional physics that yourself, uh -huh. and I suppose Richard Hoagland's been working on, and there's some sort of convergence there between your works. But uh -huh. the way that the resources on the planet have been, how can I say this, have been hijacked over time um, into various uh, projects, black op projects, that uh -huh. the, the large portion of the resources are going to very, very small projects. There's a, there's a, there's something you alluded to and it, it really struck the right side of my brain, but the left side is a, a little trouble trying to articulate it. But there's there's something in relation to the hyperdimensional physics to, to actually what's happening on the planet, on how the resources are being uh, hijacked. Is there anything in that what I'm saying ring a bell, and not a Nazi? Well, I, I, I'm having difficulty remembering exactly what I said in 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 that general connection. But my own. Uh, my own thinking is this, uh, as to what happened after the war and, and how the Nazis managed to get a, a pretty much inexhaustible supply of funding for some of these projects. And, you know, we can take a cue from, from the playbook of, of the various intelligence agencies around the world, particularly the CIA. And that is, they, the Nazis made an effort to penetrate the international drug trade, all right, and did so in conjunction with their own uh, post-war intelligence services. And probably, in my mind, there is a deep, uh, deep Nazi connection with some of the Latin American drug cartels as well. So in that respect, yes, you have a, an off-the-books supply of money which in turn you can use to fund black operations, uh, psychological warfare projects, and of course independent uh, secret research. And that, that's going to be a hefty chunk of change you know, to, to be investing in that. It's, it's literally a black budget in the true sense of the word. And I think, you know, taking a page from, from the Nazi playbook, the other intelligence agencies in the world have, have simply jumped on that bandwagon themselves. Okay, okay. And another question for you now, slight, uh, slight deviation. Uh huh. Um, what projects are, or what uh, commitments have been made by again the more sane uh, amongst us to take knowledge of, say, in a sense, in a way, it's essentially back engineering. Um, the technology that has been left scattered all over the planet, such as the pyramids. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. um, has, is there any projects that possibly could benefit uh, humanity in general and haven't been hijacked by these various factions? Well, there are, as you know, or are probably aware, there, there are a number of, of inventors and independent researchers all over the globe that have been 
inventing and pursuing things. I can think of one uh, close by you over in the United Kingdom by the name of John Searle, who's, who's done uh, some amazing research and, and uh, invented some, <laughs> some pretty wild things. But the problem is, with all of these researchers, you know, I, there's uh, the Koreas in Canada, uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Bearden in this country, you know, they're all over. The problem is, is that these people, when they try to get funding or patent their things, they, they get a little knock on the door in the middle of the night, okay? So I think what we're, what we're looking at is not so much a problem with human creativity. What we're looking at is a problem of how to bring this stuff out into the open quickly enough and fast enough so that the power elite cannot shut it down. And let's look at the motivations as to why the power elite would want to shut it down. Okay, I've already alluded to one reason earlier in that if you allow this stuff out into the open, there go your oil stock shares. All right, literally, it would it would so upset almost overnight the geopolitical structure of the world. It could conceivably lead to a very chaotic, messy international situation. So, in that sense, the elite has an altruistic motive for letting the stuff out in a controlled release rather than all at once and chaotically, all right? Because it would literally, for a short period of time, lead to an economic meltdown. But there's another reason that they have, another altruistic reason that they have to suppress this stuff. And again, I go back to my statement that I made in connection with the bell. If you successfully weaponize this stuff, theoretically, you have the potential for a weapon that would make a hydrogen bomb look like a firecracker. And this stuff, unlike nuclear weapons, you cannot trace because you know the engineering behind it is just standard electrical circuitry. So the elite is faced with a proliferation nightmare they cannot let this stuff out of the bag because quite literally it would mean any little tin horn dictator like what's his name over in North Korea, if they got their hands on this stuff, they could literally hold the world hostage. And you know, this stuff, unlike nuclear weapons, this stuff is usable because there's no nasty radioactive fallout from it. Okay. So in other words, you know, don't be too hard on the elite because they know this stuff and they are faced with some real nasty decisions. Hmm. Well, my take is Europe, well, let's say, let's focus it into Ireland. Ireland's been held hostage as it is. Sure. Uh, we are not being blown up in one fell swoop. Um, we're being destroyed slowly. Uh, and yeah. literally, literally we're being destroyed. Okay, so you're, you're given... Uh, fair argument for why they possibly you're stepping into their shoes and say well here's a couple of reasons why they couldn't just drop this information or drop the technology on um, on everyone for the right the aforementioned reasons have you given any thought as to how the technology could be introduced into the mainstream into everyone's lives so that people become aware of it they can use it they can safely use it. What what thought have you given to that yourself? Well, that's another excellent question. I haven't ever written about any of that directly, but I think basically you ha you have to do it in the following fashion. You number one have to generate enough public awareness of the fact that the physics behind this, as you've pointed out yourself in the interview, has been around for at least a hundred years. All right. You have to make people aware that this is not, you know, wild new age rambling. You have to point people to the specific physics papers that show this stuff, number one. 
And you have to also point out for the skeptical physicists, you know, doctorates in, in every obscure language of mathematics that you can conceive of who do nothing but physics on the blackboard. In other words, theoretical physicists that, that tell you, well, this stuff is impossible because my theory says it's impossible. Okay? okay. You have to point out to these people the engineering papers that show that the stuff that was being written about in theoretical physics was engineerable, okay? So that they cannot wiggle out and say, well, it's impossible, therefore we don't need to actually do any experimentation on it. The third thing you have to do is point out the actual experiments that have been done. I, I do that in Secrets of the Unified Field in particular because some American engineers decided that they would do little proof of concept experiments to show that the Philadelphia experiment wasn't such a nutty idea after all. Okay, <laughs> In other words, you have to know where to look and show that this stuff actually was being done. So you create the climate of opinion, first of all. The next thing I would urge inventors that are tinkering around in their garages or so on and so forth with some of this stuff I would urge them not to patent what they do. Now, that may seem like the wildest sort of nonsense, but in fact, if you patent your things, regardless of what country you're in, every country has some sort of national security provision for patents taken out. And if something is within the purview of a national security implication, those patents are immediately sequestered and classified. So the inventor doesn't even get access to his invention nor any income from it okay. if, it's, if it's been used. So in other words, publicize your invention as widely as possible. And that actually has been going on on the internet. Okay. Yeah. So I would say, you know, keep, keep inventing, but but make sure that you you are are uh, don't do like John Searle and build actual flying saucers and <laughs> show them off. You know, keep the inventions small scale and unthreatening. Like, let's put it that way. <laughs> okay. And who is mention this name again? The English inventor. John Searle. Uh, spell it. Jo John Searle. S E A R L. He's uh, a British uh, inventor that actually started doing his stuff back in, uh, oh, I want to say the mid-1960s. It may have been a little earlier than that, but uh, he did some rather amazing things. And <laughs> needless to say, as a result, he came to the attention of friendly people in MI5 and <laughs> right. other places. You know, sure. came, to, came to the definite attention of the Home Office, let's put it that way. <laughs> okay. All right, so he wasn't underground. John Searle, I'll look into that. Right. Um, now, here's here's a little question that I know that you, you try to stick to the facts and you stick to the, the research as much as possible, uh -huh. but you mentioned tea leaves earlier on, so let me throw this out to you. Sitting uh -huh. where you are right now, um, haven't done the research, haven't seen the patterns, haven't seen the, the um, strategies used by uh, specifically the Nazis, what do you see possibly happening? Um, what moves um, do you see taking place by the, the various factions in the next month, two months, six months, a year? Well, right in the limb here. The the my reading of the situation is is that you're going to see. You know, there, there have been gloom and doom predictions uh, from just about everybody on what's going to happen, particularly in, in North America. I just don't see those things happening because the Anglo-American elite's power base, I mean, the United States has managed to tick off so many people <laughs> all over the world. And I think justifiably, you know, I, I think much of that that uh, displeasure in, in America's actions the last 20 years is, is very justifiable. Um, you know, Russia is certainly not a friend, and China is, is 
very, very nervous about our economic policy. And, and we, Germany has, has basically uh, thumbed its nose at this country on, on more than one occasion in the last 10 years. Um, Japan is increasingly looking like it is is devolving out of the American orbit and, and going to go with much closer ties with China and with Russia and, and its own independent course. So in other words, the Anglo-American elite's power base, which at one point had a kind of a hyper-British empire global reach is now dwindling, and they can't afford to lose their remaining power base, which is in North America. I don't think that that's in the cards. I think they're too much on the defensive to, to take any big gambles like that. On the European side, I think you're going to see uh, a much, much higher presence on the world stage of, of France and Germany. Uh, you know, they're going to call it the European Union, but again, let's face it, the, the shots are being called in Paris and Berlin. Yep. And you're going to see a much higher presence on the world stage on the part of the European Union. You're going to see, uh, probably, in my opinion, you're going to see some uh, deals being cut largely between Germany and Russia, uh, I think you're going to see some real economic pressure being put on this country by China. Uh, you know, there's, there's any number of ways that, that all of this is going to play out. Um, I think in terms of the hidden factions, I think you're going to see increases of, of terrorist activity in Europe on, on the part of uh, radical Muslims. But remember something, my friends. The, the backer of those radical Muslims were the Nazis. And that, that backing began in world, prior to World War II, and it continued afterward. And, and I get into that aspect of the story in Nazi International. So That's a whole behind other story. The, oh, yes, it's a whole other story, absolutely. But... But what I'm saying is essentially behind, you know, these, these big terrorist operations, particularly 9-11, mm -hmm. that could not have happened without major intelligence coordination, without a major backer. And, of course, there have been people arguing that ever since it did happen. But what they're not looking at is the fact that, you know, they want to point the finger to Saudi Arabia, this and that and the other. What they're not looking at is the fact that you had a post-war Nazi international that was holding terrorist summits in the 1970s in nationalist Spain and inviting all these people and coordinating their activities. So in other words, you're going to see that faction uh, much more active, and you're going to see, I think... Um, increases in what I call the, the covert technological war. Okay, so a quick question. The Bushes, what faction do they mostly belong with or align themselves to? That, you know, that's anybody's guess. That family is so uh, chameleon-like in its ability to disguise where their ultimate loyalties lie. Uh, you certainly had with, with Prescott Bush, who was the father of... of uh, the 41st president and the grandfather of, of the 43rd, you certainly had a man there who had his deep connections with the Nazis. Yeah. Now, many people argue that that makes him a Nazi sympathizer. No, I don't think it does. It's, it was simply standard business practice in this country back then to conclude all sorts of deals with, with the Nazi government. Um, it was just, I hate to say it, it, was just good business back then in this country. But the Bush family does have a long and deep connection in this country to, of course, Skull and Bones, to, to the, to the uh, what I call the esoteric establishment in this country. They have a long and deep connection to the CIA and other intelligence agencies in this country. So it's anybody's guess. I, 
my own gut tells me that they are probably straddling the fence somewhere between the Anglo-American elite and, and this, this Nazi international. Waiting to see which side's going to win. Yeah, probably. <laughs> okay. In, in, the, in, the be, in the best tradition of perfidious all in. <laughs> <laughs> okay, time has caught up with us. I have to say that this was an absolute pleasure. Well, thank you. I've enjoyed it. All right. Um, if you want to come back and talk about some more of this fascinating stuff, because you really have brought us down a, a new rabbit hole, um, please um, feel free to come back sometime and discuss some That'll of That would be my pleasure. Um, now, people want to get in touch with you. They want to check out your website. They want to buy some of your books. Where do they go? Uh, my website is www.gizadestar.com. Um, they can contact me through the contact button there. I ask if they do that they use all capitals in the subject header of the email because I get so much email that if I don't see that, I just delete it, okay? okay. Um, I have to admit that I haven't kept the website up nearly as much as I should because I've been so busy writing books. <laughs> I just don't have time to write articles. But uh, to get my books, probably the best way... Uh, there in Europe would be to, to simply go to your country's Amazon store and, and order them through Amazon. Okay. Once again, Dr. Joseph P. Farrell, thank you so much for joining us here at the Irish Side of the Moon. Uh, any last thank you for having me. Any last words? No, I've, I've enjoyed it. Thank you for having me. Well, folks, Dr. Joseph Farrell, outstanding um, from any angle. Thoroughly interesting from my point of view. I hope you found uh, it interesting and got a little out of it. And again, if you have any comments or if you have any questions about any of the topics or any of the research that Dr. Farrell talked about uh, during the interview, again, just drop me a line at gabriel at the of the moon dot ie, And you can go along to gizadeathstar.com. Uh, that's www He's at deathstar.com, uh, Dr. Farrell's own website. Now, he did say in his own defense that he's so busy with other projects that he hasn't had a time to update uh, the site. But nevertheless, um, it's, it's quite proliferated with um, some very interesting stuff. Well, folks, next week's show has not been lined up just yet. Uh, Shane, or point man, or contact man, is swamped with two or three different projects. So watch this space. Um, anyway, next week's show, uh, I hope, is going to be another um, enticing and interesting show for you, the listener. Again, if you're online listening to us, or if you're listening on your local radio station, uh, join in next week to the Irish side of the moon. This has been Gabriel Logue, your host. Thank you for joining us. We are Irish Side of the Moon. Freedom of information. Personal empowerment. The Irish Side of the Moon. I still have a dream. dream, dream, dream. This is just a ride. ride, 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 ride. We can change it anytime we want. It's only a choice. No effort, no work, no job, no savings of money. A choice right now. Between fear and love. Love, love. Freedom of information, personal empowerment, the Irish side of the moon.